have been persecuted as dissenters. Nevertheless, so if we take that date, that era, when the Puritans came over, they were coming over seeking um, freedom, religious freedom. And so they wanted to settle the land and build the little churches and worship the Lord as he told us to do and in the manner in which he told us to do in the scriptures. That's what they wanted to do. So without question, it was settled in the beginning as a Christian nation, an opportunity to come over freely. Unfortunately, you've got other people who wanted to do the same thing, but they weren't necessarily Christians. By far, the chief source of contention is the involvement of the Founding Fathers with secret societies, namely Freemasonry. Certainly at the time when the Declaration of Independence was signed, many of these people were involved in masonry, no question at all about it. But it wasn't because they were dedicated to the, to the esoteric principles of masonry. Many of these people were strong Christians. In America, initially, the men that were elected, I believe 90% of them were all God-fearing men. People, you know, on the esoteric side it's, want to say, oh, this was a Masonic country. And there's an element of truth in that because uh, certainly there were many Masons, you know, uh, once America was established, who were working in key positions. I believe the truth is somewhere in between, as it usually is, the two extremes. It's a timeless struggle. Both sides of this power struggle are in full play. The sides of the secret societies trying to push forth the new Atlantis. And so it doesn't surprise me that most of these men and the uh, in the uh, Continental Congress or the signings of the Declaration of Independence were, were Masons or whatever. That doesn't surprise me, it doesn't even bother me. Because I know that underneath them is a vast horde of people that were Biblical Christians. Masonry's history with America is filled with both mystery and controversy. Because of its secrecy, and because its members are bound by terrible blood oaths, Masons are reluctant to come forward with testimony. It's a secret society. It has always been a secret society. And to reveal anything about these secret societies ensures your death. And people who've tried to expose Masonry, even to this very day, risk their lives in doing it. Yet from the shadows, some light appears. When you actually go into Masonry in the first three degrees, why, if you promise that if you are ever reveal any of the secrets of Masonry in the first degree, why, you'll have your tongue uh, uh, cut out and you'll, have your, uh, you'll be buried in the sands of the sea up to the level of your neck uh, at the level of low tide. And at the second degree, I believe they cut out your heart. Uh, and the third degree, they're going to cut out your entrails and burn them. In the 19th century, a man named Captain William Morgan was murdered by a group of Masons who were bound by such blood oaths. Well, Captain William Morgan was a uh, guy up in Batavia, New York in 1826. He uh, was the first American to publish the first three degrees of uh, Freemasonry of the Blue Lodge. The things you had to say, the oaths you had to take. And uh, Masons didn't like that very much. Captain Morgan had vi violated his oath by writing a book to let people know about the terrible oaths of this terrible society. Feeling a responsibility to the Masonic Brotherhood, three members of the order kidnapped Morgan to make him pay for exposing the secrets of Masonry. Hey, He was captured by a group of Masons and taken uh, uh, and killed. And uh, later on, the perpetrators uh, made deathbed confessions of it all, so it was all very well known. Of these deathbed confessions, at least one has survived, given by a man named Henry L. Valance, whose insight into Morgan's final moments provides a heart-wrenching account. While Valance was never brought to justice for the crime, his final confession revealed a conscience haunted by a lifetime of guilt. If the mark of Cain wasn't upon me, the curse of the first murderer was. 
the blood stain was upon my hands and could not be washed out. Valance revealed how a council of eight Masons had condemned William Morgan to death. Council, made a decision and decided your fate. Are you ready to pay for your betrayal? Talk to me, man. I've done what was right. And how Morgan had pleaded for his life on behalf of his wife and children. He commenced wringing his hands and talking of his wife and children, the recollections of whom in that awful hour terribly affected him. Please, my children, my wife. His wife, he had said, was young and inexperienced, and his children were but infants. You should have thought about that before you turned us in, before you wrote the book. May God have mercy on your children, because we will not have mercy on you. Despite Morgan's plea for mercy, Valance and his fellow Masons were determined to carry out their grim task. They gave Morgan time alone to prepare himself to die. How Morgan passed that time, said Valance, he could not tell for everything was quiet as a tomb within. When they returned, they bound his hands and led him away to the awful fate they had prepared for him. The story was he was actually drowned uh, after being mistreated horribly for a period of time. Well, when the word of this got out, and people began to realize this dangerous influence of masonry within high society, why the membership of the organization fell off dramatically. As one uh, investigator put it, as one writer put it, uh, Freemasonry, free which was rampant throughout the country at that time, almost dried up overnight. The public outrage over Morgan's death was profound, but when those who had murdered him were sought out, the people of the United States discovered that justice was not so easy to obtain. The reason was given by the Reverend Charles Finney in his book, The Character Claims and Practical Workings of Freemasonry, first published in 1869. Finney was a former Mason who lived through the Morgan Affair. He claimed that justice in the case was impossible because nearly all of the civil offices in the country were in the hands of Freemasons. According to Finney, even the newspapers of the day were completely under their control. Finney writes that it was found that they could do nothing with the courts, with the sheriffs, with the eyewitnesses, or with the jurors, and all their efforts were for a time entirely impotent. So this turned into a big brouhaha. It was a big Masonic scandal because it was all known. The Morgan incident became an issue of national importance, not simply because a man was murdered, but more importantly, Americans began to realize that their supposedly democratic country was being secretly controlled by the Masonic Brotherhood. And this led even to uh, uh, separate political parties, being anti-Masonic political parties being formed. And they were even called the Anti-Masonic Party. They were in candidates for president. And they were significant parties. They weren't just minority parties. So it was a really big deal. The Anti-Masonic Party was the first third party in American politics and eventually became the Whig Party, which is more widely recognized. The party itself was led by former president John Quincy Adams, who wrote a collection of letters and essays against Freemasonry. How can you have a free society when you have people who belong to these secret societies and have sworn these terrible blood oaths? You can't have a free society. And that's what John Quincy Adams was writing about. Adams wrote, I do conscientiously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the greatest, is one of the greatest moral and political evils. As a result of the Morgan incident, a series of official investigations took place. In 1829, a New York State Senate committee published its findings on masonry, stating that its members were found in almost every place where power is of any importance. Five years later, in 1834, a joint committee in Massachusetts reported that masonry was, quote, 
a distinct independent government within our own government and beyond the control of the laws of the land by means of its secrecy. Well, the influence of masonry uh, has always been here since those days. And of course, within 15 or 20 years, why uh, the, the membership of masonry had reconstituted itself. It said they, they got down to only about 5,000 members there when masonry was really exposed. But people soon forgot about uh, the, uh, the terrible things that had happened. And the fact that if you were a Mason, they really would kill you. Most people look upon Masonry as simply a oh, fraternity, and these oaths have no meaning. But tragically, they do. A monument was erected in Batavia, New York, and remains to this day, in remembrance of what happened to William Morgan. The inscription on its base reads, to the memory of William Morgan, a native of Virginia, a captain in the War of 1812, a respectable citizen of Batavia, and a martyr to the freedom of writing, printing, and speaking the truth. He was abducted from near this spot in the year 1826 by Freemasons and murdered for revealing the secrets of their order. The monument goes on to tell the reader where they can find the historical records that document the Morgan account. Why would the citizens of Batavia have gone to this length? Crimes are committed every day and people sometimes murdered. Why draw attention to William Morgan? Did they desire to warn future generations? Was it because the people of that time recognized, as Charles Finney asserts in his book, that America was being controlled by Masons from behind the scenes? But for what cause? For greed, power, or is the answer most likely found in the great Atlantean plan? In order to bring forth the destiny of America and lead mankind into the vision of Plato and Sir Francis Bacon, the secret societies would have to control the new world and in time subdue the old. But how to bring about this utopian empire? In his writings, Sir Francis Bacon called for a universal reformation of the whole wide world. To bring about this reform, some believe the secret societies launched a world revolution. People do not understand that our revolution was the first in a series of revolutions uh, that began in 1776 and extended right up until uh, the Cuban Revolution in 1959 when Fidel Castro came to power. And this is a series of revolutions to transform the world. While most Americans did not fight the War of Independence for the cause of global revolution, it is undeniable that secret societies played an important role and that many of America's founders were Freemasons. Many of them were Masons, but they were in, in, into Masonry uh, because, of course, this was the only way that they could protect themselves. This was the only way they could keep from being found out. So the, they were plotting a revolution. They had to have a means of maintaining their secrecy. I think Masonry was, in fact, used as a built-in network, a secret network, in which to foment the American Revolution. They didn't have to put a network together. It was already there. All they had to do was, cause, was sort of ride on the back of Freemasonry to make the American Revolution work. And work it did with the help of Masonic ingenuity, beginning with the kickoff event, the Boston Tea Party. And what was the Boston Tea Party? Who was behind that? What was, who were the raiders of the, the English tea ship? Admittedly, at this point, it was the Masonic Lodge in Boston. They were all Masons. It was the Masons wanting to implement this revolution. The leader of the men who dressed up like Indians and threw the tea into Boston Harbor was the legendary Paul Revere, whose famous ride would alert Americans that the British were coming. Pictured here with a teapot commemorating his rebellion, 
Paul Revere was a prominent member of the Masonic Order. George Washington, known as the father of our country, along with many of his generals, were also Masons. Yet Washington's involvement with Masonry is hotly debated. Our information is, is that he did not do anything with the Masonic Lodge for the last 30 years of his life. The debate centers around a letter written by George Washington to the Reverend G.W. Schneider on September 25, 1798, just 15 months before Washington's death. In the letter, Washington says specifically, I must correct an error you have run into of my presiding over the English lodges in this country. The fact is, I preside over none, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. And in Washington's case, I defend him by saying, the Masons are very secretive. When they approach a man to be a member of their organization, they will not and cannot tell him what it's all about. But what they can do and do is to say, well, you see, there were all these famous people. They were Freemasons and they can name off the kings. And today, of course, they can name off Washington. And so the candidate would then argue to himself, well, who am I? <laughs> I'm just a little guy, you know, or I might be a senator, but nevertheless, who am I compared with these? If it was good enough for them, surely it's good enough for me. If it's secret, it's going to be a good thing. So they get in and they're not told the whole story. They're not told in the first, second, or even third degree. They're not told the whole story, but little by little, as they acquire more knowledge and as they are deemed to be uh, faithful to the cause, they are told more. And that's just how they get the people in. It is only fair to mention that many Masons continue to insist that Washington was very active in the craft. Yet there is no debate about the Masonic membership of Benjamin Franklin, who is deeply involved not only with Masonry, but a whole variety of secret societies in America, in England, and in France. Societies that had everything to do with his success during the American Revolutionary War. Benjamin Franklin is a very paradoxical, complex fellow, as might be expected for someone who was such a great genius. But um, at times he seems like he's a Christian. At times he seems like he's a scoundrel. At times it seems like he's a Luciferian. And at times it seems like he's a Rosicrucian. He was a a strange character, Benjamin Franklin, a sort of a shuttle diplomat between Philadelphia and Paris and London, England. He was, of course, an ambassador in Europe, and when he was over in Europe, he became a member of a group called the Hellfire Club, which was a kind of pseudo-satanic organization in 17, 1700s. It was founded by an English nobleman named Francis Dashwood, and it basically existed as a place where men could gather and have orgies and worship the devil and basically get loaded and do whatever they wanted. <laughs> Under the guise of it being a satanic society. The Hellfire Club was a part of the so-called gentlemen's clubs of 17th and 18th century England. While the debauched behavior of these groups was initially tolerated, once they began to dabble in satanic rituals, they were forced to go underground, literally. Hellfire Club, as a matter of fact, I used to live quite near that place. It's, um, it's on the west side of London at a place called West Wickham. It's a, hall, a hill. It's a chalk hill now, of course, covered in grass. And on the top of that chalk hill is a church. On the top of the church is a golden ball. There's a cross on top of that. Now, that's a Christian church. But inside the hill is a cave. Often those chalk hills, they do have caves inside them. It's the way they're formed. And uh, the, in the cave there, they would uh, gather together. Now, I don't say that it was the church, the occupants of the church that gathered there, but whether they knew it or not, the Hellfire Club would held their, hold their meetings once a month underneath the church. And Benjamin Franklin uh, would go and visit that uh, at the times when he came to visit England, yeah. It was very much apparently into um, some of the ideas of the esoteric movement of his day. A book on witchcraft, magic, and the supernatural claims that Benjamin Franklin often came to Sir Francis Dashwood for information on the occult. 
Dashwood himself was said to be a Rosicrucian and leading member of the secret orders. In this portrait, we see a young Francis Dashwood with his hand posed in a fist-like position. In masonry, this hand signal is known as the lion's paw and is used in Masonic ritual. Among Satanists, however, this same gesture is said to be called the devil's claw. While it cannot be said how deeply involved Franklin was with the occult, the hellfire focus on drinking and debauching women would certainly have agreed with his character. He was very famous for being a ladies' man. Uh, you know, he was very much a playboy, which of course would be contrary to being a, a, a devout Christian. The Hellfire Club had great disdain for Christianity. In fact, they did not call themselves Hellfire, but rather the monks of Medmenham Abbey. Such parody was the influence of a French priest named Francois Rabelais, condemned as a heretic for writing a series of perverse comedies called Gargantua and Pantagruel. In them, Rabelais mocked religion, glorified immorality, and defended man's right to pursue without restraint the desires of his own will. Adopting his philosophy, the Hellfire motto was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Could this have been what attracted Franklin to the group, an opportunity to escape the puritanical tendencies of America? while in England to pursue lusty desires that would have been openly condemned by his fellow countrymen, at least at that time. But more than a century later, the Hellfire motto would be adopted by British occultist Aleister Crowley, who was often called the wickedest man in the world. Like Francis Dashwood and the Hellfire members, Crowley took part in satanic rituals most famously at his Abbey Thelema in Sicily, a name taken from Francois Rabelais' anti-Christian parodies. Crowley's hatred for Christianity was so intense, he often referred to himself as the Beast of the Apocalypse from the Book of Revelation. He was a Freemason and a Rosicrucian who made Do What Thou Wilt famous through the 20th century, with followers like L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, Harvard professor and drug guru Timothy Leary, and even Beatles founder John Lennon. Crowley is often credited with sparking the 1960s cultural revolution, the do your own thing mentality dedicated to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What could be called the modern legacy of men like Franklin, Dashwood, and the Hellfire Club. But wait a minute. Obviously, it cannot be said that Franklin's involvement with the Hellfire Club is to be fully equated with the often crazed activities of a man like Crowley or even Timothy Leary. Still, one must wonder what Franklin was doing with a group of immoral aristocrats who dabbled in devil worship, even if they were just kidding around as some have suggested. Is it likely that this legendary founder of America, the man who discovered electricity, invented the bifocals, and co-authored the Declaration of Independence, simply spent his time in England getting drunk and seducing women? Franklin was known to be a crafty fellow. Could his dealings with Dashwood and the Hellfire Club have somehow been a part of a greater agenda? After all, Sir Francis Dashwood was no ordinary drunken rake. He also happened to be a member of the British Parliament and was a close friend and advisor to King George III, the man the American colonists would rebel against. The Hellfire Club itself were made up of English nobility, some of whom held high offices in the King's government. Was it mere coincidence that these men, close friends of Franklin, just happened to be in power when the British were defeated? In his book, The Occult Conspiracy, 
author Michael Howard chronicles how Benjamin Franklin came to England in 1758 to discuss the future of the American colonies with Sir Francis Dashwood. Meanwhile, British historian Richard Deacon, in his History of the British Secret Service, claims that Dashwood's Hellfire Club functioned as a center of English espionage. Because of Franklin's many clandestine activities, some involving a British double agent named Edward Bancroft, Deacon and fellow historian Professor Cecil B. Curry speculate that Ben Franklin may have been a covert spy for the British government, known either as Number 72 or with the code name Moses. But was Franklin working for the British? Or were secret powers within the King's own government working with Franklin for the ancient plan of all secret societies, the New Atlantis? Why would British intelligence refer to Benjamin Franklin as Moses? Normally, enemies are given names like Carlos the Jackal or the Butcher of Baghdad. But Moses? Was the name itself a kind of cipher or secret code? Had they already determined that as Moses led the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, so Franklin would lead the American colonies to freedom from King George? Could this be why Benjamin Franklin's initial design for the Great Seal of the United States was that of Moses standing on the shoreline of the Red Sea as the waters destroyed Pharaoh and his army with the motto, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God. Coincidence? Maybe. Yet in his book, America's Secret Destiny, author Robert Hieronymus, whose doctrinal thesis on the reverse of the Great Seal has been used by the White House, the State Department, and the Department of the Interior, makes the comment that Franklin's design for the seal represented, quote, how he viewed America's birth and destiny. Did Franklin really see himself as Moses? defeating King George, the colonial pharaoh, with the help of Dashwood and the Hellfire Club. An alarming theory. But for British intelligence to undermine King George on behalf of a secret agenda should not be terribly surprising, at least not to the modern American. Consider the conflict between President John F. Kennedy and the CIA during the Bay of Pigs invasion. The CIA reportedly lied to the president on behalf of their secret agenda involving an assassination attempt on Fidel Castro, something that would later lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis. JFK was so surprised at their power, believing it to be a threat to the American people, he vowed to shatter the CIA into a thousand pieces. Or what about the Iran-Contra affair? where President Ronald Reagan stated emphatically that the U.S. was not providing arms to Iran in exchange for hostages being held by pro-Iranian terror groups. In spite of the wildly speculative and false stories about arms for hostages and alleged ransom payments, we did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. But Reagan soon returned with an apology once he learned that, yes, the U.S. was illegally selling arms to Iran, an enemy country. The profits from the sales were then being used to finance a secret CIA operation involving the Contras in Nicaragua. As with JFK, Reagan claimed that he had been manipulated and lied to by secret powers within the intelligence community. It's going on that had been kept from me in various covert Mr. operations. President, did they deceive you? We didn't answer whether Poindexter and North deceived you. Presidents Reagan and Kennedy were humiliated at being the most powerful men in the world who were unaware of what the hidden powers in their own government were up to. Well, at least in the case of Kennedy. It was later revealed that President Reagan knew more about the covert actions of the intelligence community than he had let on. After all, his vice president, George Bush Sr., was the former head of the CIA and a member of an elite secret society known as the Skull and Bones. 
Some find it interesting that while in office, President Reagan was made an honorary 33rd degree Mason. Since then, America's presidents have all been members of secret orders, including skull and bonesman George W. Bush, whose war on terror is said by some to have sparked the beginnings of World War III. Bush claimed it was the CIA who provided the information about weapons of mass destruction that ultimately led to the war in Iraq. As of the making of this documentary, that information has turned out to be false. An intelligence error? Maybe. Or perhaps the same powers that were working in the days of Benjamin Franklin have never really ceased to function. Is it just a coincidence that the war on terror has provided the opportunity to spread democracy to all the world. And this is what people don't understand, is, as our president talks about how we want to bring democracy to all these countries of the world. Well, why doesn't he want to bring a republic to these countries? We were a republic. We were never a democracy. It is only the people from the mystery religions and the secret societies who are pushing this idea of world democracy or this combination of enlightened nations, enlightened democracies to rule the world. As incredible as it may seem, there are really people who believe that, they're working full time to accomplish that goal. And until you understand that they are the primary force behind the wars of this last century and World War III, which we are entering into today, unless they understand that the whole idea is uh, to create this re-establishment of what they believe is lost Atlantis, this wonderful utopian society that they believe existed uh, eons ago. Anybody who studied the history of America knows we were not established as a democracy. Our founding fathers didn't believe in democracy. They wanted a republic, a government of law, not uh, the de democracy, which is what the secret societies have been working for for well over 3,000 years. Could this be the secret behind what's happening in the world today? And was this the underlying motive in the war for American independence? To wrestle the new world from the power of the old, that it might in time be used to bring forth the great Atlantean plan envisioned by Sir Francis Bacon. Benjamin Franklin certainly knew the works of Francis Bacon and all the ethics and things that he was uh, trying to establish. Bacon was a man that Benjamin Franklin had much in common with. Both men were the leading scientists of their time. Both men were involved in printing, and both men published works that helped to transform the people of their generation. Both men developed their own system of ciphers and secret codes, which they used for intelligence purposes during wartime. And both men were deeply involved in the Masonic and Rosicrucian movements of their day. Franklin was a member of Masonic and secret orders in America, in England, and in France, the three countries involved in the American Revolution. But some researchers argue that his influence in France truly demonstrates his loyalty to a plan that looked beyond America to a global revolution. He was the master of the uh, uh, Lodge of the Nine Sisters, Nochois, the Lodge of the Nine Sisters right in Paris, and that's where the revolution started instantly. So he was lodge master there every time he visited the place. He, as so many young people, very intelligent people, really believed that man could create a better society without being totally reliant upon God. And of course, we know that he eventually he went to France, and he was when he was in France as the American ambassador to France, uh, he was instrumental in pushing these ideas that led to the French Revolution. Franklin went to France to convince King Louis the Sixteenth to finance the American Revolution. But in the process, Franklin was preaching radical ideas that would later on inspire the French to overthrow Louis the very monarch who had helped to pay for the founding of America. Americans desperately needed money to fight the War of Independence because, according to Franklin, England had ruined their economy to keep America from becoming too prosperous. 
when he was ambassador to England, um, the Bank of England said, how come America, the, the representatives of the Bank of England said, how come America is getting so rich? And Franklin, in his autobiography, recounts the story and said, well, that's easy. In America, we create our own money and we owe no interest to pay to no one. Uh, so the Bank of England said, oh, that's very interesting. So they immediately had passed through Parliament the Currency Act of 1764. And what did the Currency Act do? It outlawed uh, the creation of America's own money and made, um, put America on the gold standard, made Americans pay their taxes in gold or silver coin, which of course was very scarce in the American colonies in those days. So what was the result? It, it immediately plunged America into a deep depression. Franklin says that this, this depression, and uh, uh, everyone in America was well aware of what the depression, who caused the depression, why it was caused, just because England outlawed America just simply printing its own money, and that it was this uh, Currency Act of 1764 that was really the root cause of the American Revolution, because it caused uh, so much unemployment and uh, uh, a terrible economic upheaval. And Franklin's quote is, we could have endured a little tax on tea and other matters, but it was England's taking away our ability to create our own currency that was really the root cause of the revolution. And so King Louis supported the American cause through financial aid and the use of troops. But some years later, many of the French soldiers who fought for America would return to France to fight the French Revolution. Among their leaders would be an American hero, the Marquis de Lafayette, who served alongside George Washington. Lafayette was also a Freemason and close acquaintance of Benjamin Franklin, the man who seemed to be the friend of nearly all the revolutionaries of the day. It was Benjamin Franklin who initiated Voltaire himself uh, in 1778. He could then brag and say, well, Voltaire was a Mason. Ooh. People would say, if it's good enough for him, it must be good enough for me. I don't know what it's all about, but it sounds like a good thing. While the writings of Voltaire inspired the French revolutionaries, Americans were compelled by another of Franklin's close friends, Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was a member of the Lunar Society. Benjamin okay. Franklin would go and meet with them, yeah. Anyway, he recognized in Thomas Paine that the fellow was, um, he was pretty good at writing. And so he brought him back with him to Philadelphia and he wrote the pamphlets, the pamphlets that started the revolution in America. It was a little booklet called Common Sense. Thomas Paine wrote that, and it was kind of um, inciting people to war against King George III. With the help of Paine and his fellow Masons, Franklin worked to create the revolutionary mentality among the colonies. Yes, Franklin developed the concept of the virtuous revolution. The thought of revolting against a monarch uh, amongst European people was absolutely anathema. It went 